everyone. Thank you for joining Yo Soy today. We're downtown Fresno at the CMAC building. Come down and tour. We have a very special guest for you today. We have Sheriff. And first Mims. of all, and this is an exciting thing to do. This is very close to being able to talk to the community in person uh, when I get to be here at CMAC. Uh, first of all, and, you know, my involvement in law enforcement is here it is in mid 2018. Mm -hmm. So this is my 38th year involved in law enforcement. Yes, I'm almost 39 years. And I started my career in the small town of Kerman, in the west side of Fresno County. Really? Yeah, I sure did. I started there. I was their first female police officer. And uh, the story is kind of interesting, but uh, I'm a woman of faith. I know this didn't happen accidentally. Mm -hmm. So I thought I wanted to be a teacher. Uh, and I worked in this elementary school for many years. I was a single mom at the time. Mm -hmm. I had a little boy. Uh, and I worked as a teacher's aide in a second grade classroom. Okay. And I found out that was not going to be my career. <laughs> Just by working <laughs> in that second grade classroom, I thought, mm -hmm. oh, there's a special place in heaven for teachers, believe me. And oh. I knew that was not going to be for me. Yes. But I worked at the school many years. So. Now, let me ask you a question. Kerman, you ended yeah. up in Kerman. I, right. didn't, weren't you raised in Carruthers? How far is that from Carruthers? <clears throat> My elementary school years were in the small town of San Joaquin. Oh. Okay. And then uh, my family moved to Carruthers, so that's where I went to high school. Oh. So I say, go Blue Raiders, any chance I get. <laughs> okay. So Carruthers, Kerman, they're all within all proximity close, to each other. Right. Oh, okay. So, well, Carruthers, now you said you were in Kerman and then moved to Carruthers? San Joaquin and, then, and San then Joaquin. to Carruthers, right. Oh, my goodness. So you, uh, were you on a farm or? My, in San Joaquin, my father worked uh, on a dairy farm. So I grew up on a dairy and I remember being little and my sister and I walking to the milk barn with our little aluminum milk can uh -huh. and filling it up in the milk barn and then carrying it back. And we were so small that this milk can, it took both of us to get it back to, to the house. Uh -huh. But I have very good memories of, of living uh, on that dairy farm and, and growing up out in the country where uh, I love animals. And so we always had cats around and we would catch crawdads out of the, the uh, canals near where we lived. And mm -hmm. it was just a very good childhood. Yes, that sounds exciting. Yeah. I, I love animals too. But uh, cows, you get to make the butter and have the whipped cream. Right. And it's delicious when you're getting it that fresh. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, there's a special place in my heart for rural Fresno County. Yes, I believe that's true. Not most of your family is here in, in well, I, I grew up, I'm, I'm the oldest of three children. Uh -huh. And um, my, I lost my younger sister a few years ago. She uh -huh. passed. Um, and I have a younger brother. He's the youngest in the family. He lives uh -huh. in Southern California. Oh. So I have two kids, four grandkids. They all live here close um, uh -huh. or around where my husband and I live. Uh -huh. And my mom lives with us. So we're, we're all pretty tight-knit. Oh, okay. Super, super. Yeah. So then from there you gravitated to the school. Yeah. How in the world did you get into the school <laughs> as a school teacher? Yeah, well, I, I worked under, there used to be um, government grants. They were called CETA grants. Mm -hmm. And they were for people who were needy. I was needy at the time. I, mm -hmm. I needed to earn a living. I was low income. I was a single mom and I needed a job. And mm -hmm. so I went to work with, under a CETA grant at this elementary school. You were a AFD? Yes. AFDC yeah. recipient? I, I did not collect um, any any aid, but I got the, the grant. Uh, I did collect unemployment because as a teacher's aide, you were laid off during the summer. Oh, okay. And so I, I collected some unemployment for that. And that mm -hmm. was, um, it was a big learning time in, in my life. I, I had to depend on myself. Of course, my parents uh, helped, you know, watch mm -hmm. my little boy when I needed help with babysitting. Can I ask you about what age were you? I was 19 years old. Okay, so you were a young mom. Very young, okay. yeah, I was a young yeah. mom. So 18 when you had yeah. your baby? Mm -hmm. Me t I was yeah. too, so, okay. But I tell you what changed my life, and it was a telephone call, and it was from my dad. And he said, I'm going to a 
retirement dinner tonight. Your mom has a headache. She doesn't want to go. I don't want to go by myself. Would you go with me? Okay. And I said, sure, Dad, I'll go with you. So I went with him, and the, the dinner was a retirement party for the retiring chief of police for the city of Kerman. And while I was there, I met the incoming chief of police, and he said words to me that changed my life. He said, one of my goals as chief of police here is I want to hire the first woman police officer. And I said, if I know of anybody interested, I'll let you know. And but <laughs> on the way home that night, I told my, my dad, I said, I, I need a career. I need to be able to support myself and my son. I might be on my own forever, but I knew I needed a career. Mm -hmm. So I applied for that job, and I was hired. And that's why I, I say I'm a woman of faith. I know that phone call didn't happen by accident. That was meant to be. Mm -hmm. That was just meant to be. Mm -hmm. And of course, our family joke is, had my mom not had a headache that night, who knows what the heck I would be doing, right? <laughs> but that, that was not by accident. I truly believe um, God had a hand in launching my career, because here I am 38 years later as the sitting sheriff of Fresno County. And you've been all over. I've been all you've over. You've been yeah. to Washington. You met the president. Yeah. You, I mean... This is a great example for the young ladies that are out there in the audience watching us. I've been listening. able to meet two presidents. Two, two oh, what was president, the other one? President Obama. Really? I was able to meet with him, and it was all surrounding immigration reform and trying to fight for reform. This was back in 2000 and uh, probably 2013, 14, when mm -hmm. we were trying to get immigration reform. That's how. Mm -hmm. It's taken too long, but we're still, you know, Working trying hard. to make that happen. But um, well, yeah, it's quite an honor. What is, <clears throat> I know when you accepted the job, I'm sure that you had a, a little bit of concern mm. and fear. So can you explain to the audience how you bridged that and continue to, continued on your path to where you are today? Well, I, I will say that when I started for the city of Kerman, that was completely um, an unknown. I was green. You know, I just, my, my father was involved in law enforcement. But personally, I, I just never saw myself growing up in that career. I thought being a teacher was going to be my life. Right. Um, but when I started with Kerman, it, I was very apprehensive. They sent me through the police academy, and I graduated. I was one of two women in a class of about 35 people in the police academy. Uh, and at that time, I was 25 years old. So I worked at this school for a long time, from the time I was about 19 to when I was 25. And even at 25, I was one of the oldest people going through the class. So here I was, one of the oldest. I was a single mom, you know, trying to support myself and making it through. And it was not easy. It, mm -hmm. it was not an easy time. I just... Thank God for my parents who really helped me out with mm -hmm. uh, watching my little boy at the mm -hmm. time, and <clears throat> that was they were very supportive and helpful. Uh, but and it takes about six months to get through the academy, and I was successful and I made it through and I graduated and immediately on graduation I had other agencies trying to recruit me because people w want agencies wanted to hire women. Oh. There just weren't a lot of us back in 1980. Well, I was <laughs> this, ask it was you. a long time ago, uh -huh. and I I said no because I owed that chief of police mm -hmm. some loyalty because mm -hmm. he took a chance. He took a big chance in recruiting me and giving me the opportunity and giving me that job, mm -hmm. and I stayed in Kerman uh, about four and a half years before I decided to move on. And I I knew that the sheriff's office was going to be the agency I, I wanted to work for. Now, how did you decide that? Well, I, I wanted to work for a larger agency. Um, Kerman, at the time, was very a very small town. It's grown a lot in 38 years. It was, it was a small town. Mm -hmm. uh, and I took a look at the sheriff's office and all the opportunities, all the different things that, that you could do as a deputy sheriff. Mm -hmm. and, and I will tell you that it wasn't immediately successful for me to go to work for the sheriff's office either. So I applied the first time and I wasn't hired. I just didn't make it high enough on the list. Okay. Explain uh, <clears throat> what that means. Sure. Uh, when you go to work for the sheriff's office, actually any county uh, department, you have to take a test and they only take a certain number of people. Mm -hmm. And if you don't 
rise above that line where they, they make a decision, mm -hmm. you have to try again. Right. And I tried again. And at that time, they were only choosing people that spoke Spanish. Oh and I don't speak Spanish. And so, um, I, again, I, I wasn't chosen that time. So that's two. That's two. It took me three times. The third time I applied, I was hired. And I went to work for the sheriff's office in August of 1983. How wonderful is that? Three times. Three times. But the idea, or the, we can't give up. Don't That's give up. That's the message. And the, the message is you never know, and when I talk about working at the school and end up becoming a police officer, and the lesson is what you think you want to do may not be what you're meant to do. Mm -hmm. it, it, to me, obviously, as I look back now, I was meant to be involved in law enforcement. I, it was meant to be. And so I think the lesson for young people especially is when that door of opportunity opens, are you ready to take a risk? Mm -hmm. And are you ready to um, step forward? Are, are you just ready to walk through that door? And sometimes it's scary and it can be intimidating, but you learn something. Mm -hmm. Even if it may not work out, you learn lessons. Mm -hmm. And in my case, it worked out. I, mm -hmm. I, I was a little uncomfortable. It was a scary. It was very risky, risky. But I knew what I wanted with my life, and that was a good career. Mm -hmm. OK. So when someone or when you do recruitment now for your department, are you encouraging more women to join, or how does that work? We, we do. We, we try to make sure that when we do recruit, we have women on the recruiting team mm -hmm. just to kind of show, see, it's, it's possible. It's possible for women to do this job, and it's encouraged. I think it's important for people to understand that you don't have to go in to an agency in law enforcement and know how to shoot, how to drive a patrol car, how to do all. All of that is trained. You are trained in mm -hmm. how all of that works. Generally, <coughs> can I interrupt? Generally, that training, each step takes like six months, three months. They're all different the intervals. Yeah, the entire police academy is six months old, mm -hmm. six months long. Oh. And then when, once you graduate from the academy, every agency has their own, what we call a, an FTO, or field training program. Oh, okay. And so that's about another 15 or 16 weeks. So it takes a, a long time, almost a year, just of training before you are given your own set of patrol car keys and, and told to, to go out and do your job. But it's uh, in the sheriff's department, singular people or double? When we work, we work single person patrol cars. Yeah. Oh. You, you might see two people in a patrol car. It might be somebody with a trainee. It might be a ride along, and it might, or it might be one of our reserves. Uh, that that work, but most of the time, you you're assigned to a beat somewhere in the county, mm -hmm. uh, and you're alone in your patrol car. Okay, now, a Fresno Sheriff's Department covers what areas? Fresno County is six thousand square miles, so when you try to picture what that looks like, keep in mind that we are larger than three states in our union. We're larger than Connecticut, Rhode Island, or New Hampshire just our county. Mm -hmm. And so that's huge. That's why we have the ability to have our air support unit, for instance. We've got two helicopters. We have a fixed wing. We have an air, airplane. Mm -hmm. uh, we need the ability to get to places very quickly because we're large. And some of our terrain is hard to get to. Huh. When yes. you think about um, eastern Fresno County and the Sierra Nevada mountains, so many times you know, we share a border with Inyo County, for example. Mm -hmm. Sometimes Inyo County will get a call of somebody lost or overdue hiker in their mountains, mm -hmm. but it's easier for us to get there. And so we will help them out and vice versa. Sometimes it's a Fresno County, but it's easier to get there from Inyo County. So communication with the seven other counties that touch our borders is very important. Oh, okay. So now you're saying that uh, individual, the sheriffs are singular in their cars. Mm -hmm. So procedurally, I would imagine, I mean, if I were out there, I'd want somebody to back me up. So because you're, you have a lot of wide open right. space still. 
it's um, sometimes your backup is not immediately available. Uh, mm -hmm. I, it's very important when you work in those conditions, mm -hmm. it's important you learn how to talk to people. You, you need to know how to communicate. Mm -hmm. You might be your, by yourself for quite some time. Mm -hmm. So you might need to know how to de-escalate a situation that you're at all by yourself. Uh, and I think that's an important skill to learn for any law enforcement officer to learn how to talk to people. Okay. Because you might be by yourself for quite some time. So in those situations, I mean, over time I'm sure that you learn by experiencing the situation, <clears throat> but say for example, to if somebody out there is considering especially a young lady, is considering looking at your department just to ease their fears once, I mean, once they get in and get out of the academy and go through the extra 15 weeks training, you're still going to be a little uncomfortable and not knowing. So how do you manage them at that point? Uh, they, they really uh, have a whole year of probationary time. So they're, they're going to be tested. And most of the time, we assign people in our busiest area, that, that's metropolitan okay. Fresno County. Uh, sometimes we train out in the, our Selma substation. We have four different substations in the county. Mm -hmm. And one of them is Selma. And that's a, this, like the second busiest uh, area that, that we have. Mm -hmm. So we try to put them in, in places where they're going to be busy. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, you just learn. You learn how to conduct yourself. You really depend and rely on your training that, that you get. Mm -hmm. uh, you rely on your communication skills. You mm -hmm. just, you just um, have to be a decision maker because we don't have immediate supervision to fill on, with deputies on every call. Right. You've got to be able to make your decisions. Okay. And one thing I let our employees know is you don't need permission to do your job. You know, do your job, do the right thing, do what you know that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Don't call somebody and ask permission. If you mm -hmm. know what to do, just take care of business. Mm -hmm. Just go ahead and take care of it. Um, so now uh, I want to ask a question about how your department works as far as reaching out to community individuals to draw them in to become, consider right. your career path. <clears throat> we have a recruiting team at the sheriff's office, so mm -hmm. we are regularly at career fairs. There are a lot of different agencies, including the county of Fresno, will have mm -hmm. days where people will come that are looking for careers, and, mm -hmm. and we tell them about what we do. I encourage people to come on ride-alongs. Uh, to, to ride along and see what um, our patrol deputies do. I encourage people to tour the jail. If you're, mm -hmm. you're thinking about a corrections career, come in and tour the jail. See if this is what you think is for you. Okay, would they ask a specific person or call Just call my office. Just call your call office? Call my office and, and my assistant will make it happen. Okay. Uh, but we, we truly encourage people to take, take that tour. In fact, for many nonprofit organizations, I might donate a jail tour and a lunch with the sheriff. But it's an, it gives me the ability to really show the community what the job of a correctional officer really is. Can you imagine trying to deal with serving 10,000 meals a day? That's just about what we have. Um, feeding, uh, medicating, getting people to and from court. We take probably within uh, 300 people a day, back and forth to, to some kind of court proceeding, mm -hmm. Monday through Friday. Mm -hmm. So if you like logistics, you know, that's, that's a good job mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, a, a lot of opportunity. And, and for deputy sheriff, somebody that comes to work, and once they learn their job, they have an opportunity. They might want to work canine. I had a dog for two years, so that was a, a probably the most fun assignment I had in the sheriff's office. They might want to work um, a detective position. They may want to work in our boating patrol. They might want to be one of our search and rescue team members. We mm -hmm. get a lot of calls. People go up to the mountains, um, even urban searches too, but most of the time it's an overdue hiker or somebody gets lost or injured and mm -hmm. we've got to send our search and rescue team, not only members of the sheriff's office, but we've got about 200 volunteers 
that help us with search and rescue. We train them. They get an emergency services card, and they help us when we have lost uh, people. We've, when I talk about urban search and rescue, the, the most immediate example I can think of is an Alzheimer's patient. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody who walks away from a uh, assisted care home and they're lost. We actually do search and rescue. We, we will even call in our volunteer posse members to come in and they'll ride canal banks or in fields or, or track somebody. Uh -huh. But it's a, a really good opportunity for people who want to, they don't want to work for the sheriff's office, they can volunteer and work when they can. So how many, they just call your office for that just as call, well? Just call the office. And how many volunteers do you usually <coughs> have on hand? Or do you just? Well, I, I will tell you one of our largest volunteer groups is our um, volunteer chaplains in our jail. We have over 200 people who volunteer their time of all religious denominations mm -hmm. to come in and minister to inmates in our jail, oh. which is a very helpful, very mm -hmm. helpful mm -hmm. for for people who really are looking for help and resources, mm -hmm. those chaplains are a resource. Mm -hmm. uh, and then our second largest group is our search and rescue. So somebody, for instance, that has a horse, they can become part of our search and rescue posse. Mm -hmm. They have a Jeep, they can be part of our uh, Jeep unit, uh, four wheel drive. Really? Uh, if somebody likes to hike, they can be part of our mountaineering unit. We call them our ground pounders. They can, you know, hike and, mm -hmm. and look for people. Okay. Uh, we have a volunteer air squadron. So if somebody's got an airplane and they, they want to be part of the air squadron, they can do that. There are all kinds of opportunities for people that have the interest to come and be crime fighting partners. Wow, I didn't know you did volunteers. Yeah. I want to ride a pony. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. Saddle up. There you go. And then do you, I mean, when you say you train them, what, what type of, <clears throat> I'm sure you don't do the six months. Uh, no, but no. What, um, what we do is we train them, for instance, in uh, how to read GPS. Okay. So, you know, coordinates, that's going to be important, especially if, if you have a, a mountain search. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, how to support yourself, what to pack if you back by yourself two, three, four days. Um, how, how do you live off the land? Mm -hmm. uh, and a, an example is a couple of years ago, we had the rough fire in Fresno County. Mm -hmm. uh, largest wild land fire that we've ever had. At the same time, we had a lost hiker from San Francisco. Oh dear. And the problem was because of the smoke from the wire, fire, we couldn't get air support up. Oh no. And so we had to send in our search and rescue teams back, it was 20 miles from where they parked their cars to where they, this lost person had camped. Oh dear. So it took three days just to get, hike into a starting point and then to have minimal air support. It, it was a, it was a, great operation. Nine days later, uh, a, a team, actually it was a Marin County team, because we called for mutual aid. It, la it lasted nine days. Mm -hmm. And we found this woman alive. She was injured severely, oh but she gosh. was alive. But and the dedication of all of these teams to mm -hmm. have to walk in three days. To, and remember, you've got to have all of your food, all of your water. Uh, something to sleep in, shelter, you've got to have all of that planned and you're packing it in. Uh, and then before you can even start your search, it's three days, then you start your search. And so she was found. And keep in mind, that's another three days. They've got to hike out. Out, right. Uh, and they had run out of some supplies. They fashioned some safety pins into hooks. So they were able to go fishing, and, you know, and catch their, their uh, their meals, and I just, I just think it's a wonderful thing to have that kind of team where you can be innovative, mm -hmm. you can enjoy the outdoors, mm -hmm. uh, you can do something really good for your community, mm -hmm. and be part of a team. That the esprit de corps is very important when it comes to something like that. You're really part of a team with a common goal. You know you have to work together because you can't do it by yourself. Yeah. And that just creates a real cohesive group and the camaraderie is uh, something to see. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I had no idea. Do all sheriff's departments have this volunteer system? 
most sheriff's offices have volunteers to do something. Mm -hmm. I, I know the ones that, for instance, that have the, the rugged terrain and mm -hmm. mountain areas have search and rescue like mm -hmm. we do. If it's a more urban county and they may not have mm -hmm. um, r rural areas, mm -hmm. they probably don't have the search and rescue to the extent that, that we need one. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. That's Now, since you have these volunteers, I have a question. Do you bring on teens? Do you have a program for teenagers? Y you bet we do. We have an Explore program, mm -hmm. and it's actually through the Boy Scouts of America, and it's for boys and girls who are looking at maybe law enforcement is the career for me. Mm -hmm. We have uniforms for them, and they help us out with many different events. In fact, they have been to recruiting um, shows and, and open houses uh, with us also. They will volunteer at events like every summertime we have a sheriff activity league at several different school sites, mostly rural underserved areas. I, I like Carruthers, Del Rey, we've done it in Biola, uh, we've done it in Layton and Riverdale we, where we have these these um, after school, it's mo mostly summertime programs mm -hmm. and we send our explorers out there. What's important about the Activity League is we use, we use young people from those communities who are college students to help us with those summer programs. And so for the kids in those communities, they mm -hmm. see it's a positive experience with Sheriff's Office. Mm -hmm. They see young people from their community who are college students, so they know, hey, it's possible for me to go to college, to mm -hmm. get an education. She's from my community, or he's from my community. I can do what they did. Exactly. And that's an important message to mm -hmm. send to these mm -hmm. kids, especially in our rural areas. Yeah. Great example. Yeah. Right, right, right. So how many, let me ask you a question now. The, how many people are you managing? In the sheriff's office, as, uh -huh. a, as a whole, we have, we've got over 1,250 employees uh, and that's a, a good point that you bring up because if somebody wants to work in, like in the sheriff's office uh -huh. they don't have to choose to be a deputy sheriff or a correctional officer they might decide to work in our clerical staff or in our business office mm -hmm. uh, we need um, accountants we need HR people for human resources we need CSI we have a whole um, laboratory. We do our own DNA testing. So you might want to work in our lab. You may want to work with in our evidence and uh, identification bureau. Mm -hmm. You're the person that are looking at the, for the fingerprints, working the crime scenes, taking the pictures. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's such a wide variety of opportunities mm -hmm. that people have. It's pretty exciting. Yeah, that's I'm listening to. I'm like, oh my goodness, we could go in and <laughs> solve a murder case. And I mean, yeah. that would be great. Now the the Explorers is the teenage group? Or? <clears throat> the Explorers is a teenage group. Do they get it's, involved with any of that or they, um, exposed? We, they are actually trained. They do get exposed to some of it, not all of it. Okay. And in fact, they are actually involved in some competitions with explorers across the country. You know, we will teach them how to investigate a crime scene. Mm -hmm. uh, they will they were actually train them in firearms, and they will go and compete against explorer groups from other other places. And so uh -huh. they they kind of have that training period where they're making a decision: is this for me or is it not for me? Mm -hmm. But it's pretty exciting. They've done very well in those competitions. Mm. Now, uh, for example, in the Explorer group, how many of those folks that come out and experience the volunteer system return and become? A lot. Yeah, quite a we, few. We, we have a lot. And, and, you know, part of the, an agency's culture is very important. And so, and that's a lot of my job. I, I need to create a culture where people want to work for an agency that match their values. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's a leadership issue. Mm -hmm. You know, leadership is values based. Mm -hmm. and, and one thing as I recruit people, I say, if, if you want to come to work for a law enforcement agency because you want to wear a uniform or shoot a gun or drive a patrol car fast, please, Go to work for somebody else. <laughs> I want people who 
care, who mm -hmm. want to serve. Uh, all of that other stuff kind of comes with it. Mm -hmm. But what, what is the true intention of somebody when they come to work? I mean, you're, you're going to have a good career. Mm -hmm. You're going to make pretty darn good pay. You're going to have a pretty darn good retirement mm -hmm. and, your, and benefits. But what's the underlying real impetus for you wanting to come to work for a law enforcement agency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I want people who care, who want mm -hmm. to serve, because we are called public servants. That's right. And that has had better be uppermost in mm -hmm. a person's mind. Yeah, it's a highly skilled customer service yeah. because you're dealing with people day in and day out every second. Yeah. And uh, not everyone, <coughs> most people are good people. I mean, they're not going to be out there causing trouble. Just need I a little direct, that. yeah. They have need a little direction or, you know, understanding or knowledge. I think they you just you might need it. the resources. They mm -hmm. might need the opportunity. They, they might need a lesson. You know, <laughs> it, it, whatever. Uh, it's important that we have independent thinkers, people that are pro true problem solvers, mm -hmm. especially when you're working out in an area and you get assigned to beat. You're probably going to be on that same place tomorrow. <laughs> and so if you don't handle the issue, mm -hmm. you're going to have to do it again tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So be a problem solver. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you get to know your people, you as you say, in your beat. That's my hope. That's mm -hmm. my hope that, that the deputies out there are actually um, getting to know the community and, mm -hmm. and caring. And I, I have an example. So we had a, um, it was a scary situation. A toddler fell into a swimming pool. And the deputy gets there about the same time as the ambulance and mm -hmm. the little boy. <clears throat> um, his mom had actually got him out of the pool. And he goes to the hospital. He's okay. He, he recovers, thank goodness. Yes. But a few days later, the deputy went by, knocked on the door, and the mom answered. And, and the deputy said, I'm just checking to make sure your little boy is still okay. That was kind of a scary situation for us. Mm -hmm. And the, I didn't hear this from the deputy. I heard it from the mom. I, we hap I happened to be at an event, and this mom was there, and she said, "Did you know what one of your deputies did?" And she told, and I thought, that's a perfect example of a public servant. Mm -hmm. Nobody asked that deputy to do that. Mm -mm. It was truly a, a s public servant's heart mm -hmm. that caused that deputy to go back. And I thought, mm -hmm. that's exactly what I want. Yeah, his concern, right? The people part, the right. people concern. Yes. So what would you give, share with us an example of through your 38 years when you felt like, you know, the epiphany came on and you said, you know, this is really what I was meant to do. When did that <clears throat> happen? I, I think, wow, I, I think that happened probably when I was promoted to lieutenant, I had two things that happened to me at that point in my career. And that was still, it, it took too long, 1998, when I was promoted to a lieutenant. And for a long time, up until that time, I always felt a burden that I had to do more. I had to make more arrests. I had to write more reports. I had to answer more calls. I, I just felt that it was important for me to prove myself over and over and over again. Was that because you're a female? Yes. I, I, I think I have to prove to people that I can do this job. Mm -hmm. And I was promoted to lieutenant, and it was at that time I thought, wait a minute, why am I carrying a burden that's not my burden to carry? If someone thinks I can't do this job because I'm a woman, that's their problem. That's not my problem. So why mm -hmm. am I carrying the load? And I let it go. And uh, what an epiphany that was for me mm -hmm. to know that I don't have to carry that load anymore. I just let it go. And that was that's another important thing, I think, to young women out there. Don't carry loads you don't, you, you don't have to. Mm -hmm. I mean, things are hard enough. Uh, and don't take on problems that aren't yours to carry. Mm -hmm. And we have a tendency as women, I think, I, I think to so do too. that. I think so. Yeah, uh, maybe it's the nurturing part of us 
or I, I don't know. I, I just the the confidence just really kicked in though at that at that point. Mm -hmm. and, and I thought I am trained, I am competent, I work hard. There is no substitute for working hard mm -hmm. in, because if you're just going to get by, you're not going to go anywhere. Right. Right? You have to work hard to get mm -hmm. what you want. It's commitment. Right. Commitment, 100%. If you're in there, right. it's always I always heard 110%. <laughs> commitment um, but that's a great message yeah. because the young ladies out there I know were trained in a, in a mat socialized at home in a certain yeah. manner which I think now in 2018 we're changing that especially with a lot of the things that have gone on in the last three four years there and there seem to be more and more um, single moms out there who are, are trying to make it and it's it's difficult. It's very difficult, mm -hmm. and, and I'll never forget. You know, working and making sure your babysitters are lined up. You have plan A, B, and C, and it, you just it's it's difficult, especially in the law enforcement world when you work shift work. So you might be working not just daytime, but you might work a swing shift or a graveyard shift, mm -hmm. not have the weekends off, and, and that's that can be difficult. Mm -hmm. I. My family really, I go keep going back to that because um, I, I did end up remarrying, and uh, my husband helped with the kids. We we have a little girl also, a little girl. She's 33 this this year. <laughs> she's a little girl. She's got kids of her own now, <laughs> but we have our, my son and, and our our daughter mm -hmm. and our four grandchildren now. I get a lot of joy out of. But that's difficult when you make a decision to get involved in a, a career like this, knowing. You're going to be working shifts and nights and mm -hmm. holidays, and I'll, I'll never forget having to leave my daughter's, I think it was her sixth year birthday party. I got called mm. out on a, a call. I had to leave, and thank goodness for my husband who, who understood this is what I was doing when we got married. So is he, a, is he in law enforcement as well? No, he works for a construction company. That's interesting. Yeah. How in the world did that occur? Because you have a, <laughs> like you said, your shifts. Yeah. And those shifts, I mean, are they assigned to you for like one month or is it just like one week rotation or? We actually can sign up based on seniority for where and what shift we want to work at. Oh. And so usually once you get some seniority, you, you can work in, in one place for quite some time. But it took me a long time. For instance, I, I talk about my little girl. One time when she was five years old, we we are packing up to go camping. Uh -huh. She said, Mom, what are you doing? And I said, I'm packing, we're going camping. And she said, you mean you're going with us this time? So she was used to going on vacations without me because of my shift work and my job. Mm -hmm. But it, she was five years old. <laughs> and so you, you really have to make a decision on that commitment, you you have to make a decision on um, on your career. That once you decide, you're you're truly committed. Mm -hmm. You truly are committed, mm -hmm. and your family has to understand. You know, this is the nature of the animal. This mm -hmm. is, this is the nature of of the career. Mm -hmm. uh, and I I think about it. I have most of my career. I've been available on call 24/7, and so you live this life, and it's it's part, it's ingrained in you. Uh, mm -hmm. Even when you go home, your family knows you could leave at any time if something happens. Uh, but it's a total family commitment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you said family, your extended family, but you have an extended, you have two <coughs> extended families, because. Your sheriff's group, right. it's a family, and people don't realize. It is. It's a, it's a huge and, family. And we're people. Uh, you know, we bleed, we cry, um, we get sick. Um, but when you, when you think about the agency of 1,250 people, um, there's always some kind of tragedy going on in somebody's life. Either mm -hmm. they get very sick, or they have a family member that's sick, or they have people in their family passing away, and... Um, I try to make an effort, you know, I send cards, I make phone calls whenever we have people in the agency that 
that are hurting. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have some really good people who will give me the heads up and say, hey, by the way, you know, we have a correctional officer who, who just lost a parent or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I can make sure that I, I pay some personal attention to that, e either through a phone call or a card. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm, I send them to their home. And mm -hmm. it's, um, there's something happening all the time when you have an agency that large. Huge, huge, 1,200 people. Yeah. So now, being on call, you have your extended family. My question to you would be, what do you see? I mean, you're, you've been fully involved and engaged with having to go out on emergencies. This is 38 years that you've been doing this. <coughs> what do you see for yourself in the next five years? Well, I, I'm got another term to go, so I was just elected mm -hmm. uh, for another four-year term. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm not feeling retirement yet. I, mm -hmm. I'm just not. I have uh, some things I want to do. I want to finish building a brand new jail. We have a new substation that we're trying to get started building right now. Uh, start replenishing some positions, like deputy sheriff positions that we lost during the economic downturn. Mm -hmm. There's how many I, how many people do you need? We we need about another sixty deputy sheriffs. Okay, everyone. Yeah, sixty positions out Come there. Come on down. <laughs> and uh, training and all. Right, that's great. Right. So there's there's a lot, and I understand. There's always going to be something else to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a couple of special projects, such as the jail and the substation, that I really want to make sure we get to the point of no return mm -hmm. before I start thinking about well, retirement. Well, I wasn't thinking retirement. I was thinking maybe you were on to another level. Oh, n like another elected office? Oh, no. you never know. You know, I, I just, I'm in the sheriffing business. I, I just, I've been asked to run for um, national or state office and mm -hmm. it, it just has never, I've never had my fire fire in the belly about that mm -hmm. and I, I think to do that mm -hmm. you better have that fire and <laughs> and I've just never felt it I mm -hmm. I truly feel I'm where I belong mm -hmm. and I'm at peace with that that's good something may came come along you know when the time comes it's kind of mm -hmm. like that phone call I got that night and uh -huh. I went to work for Kerman I'll, I'll leave my uh, faith to lead me where I think I'm supposed to be mm -hmm. but right now I I know I'm, I'm where I belong. Mm -hmm. That's good. So your project with the jail, I understand there's a whole mental health ward or? Yes, I, now our new jail, I'm, I'm very uh, eager to get that project done. In mid 2020, it's supposed to be completed. Once we open that up, we'll be able to shut down our old jail that was built in 1941. So you can imagine how antiquated that mm -hmm. old building is. Mm -hmm. So um, the new jail will have special construction so that we're better able to address inmates that have mental health issues, medical issues, uh, a reentry program space to, so that probation can come, come in and help us prepare people to leave jail because people don't stay in jail in a local jail all their lives you know they they have to be ready to go out and become part of the community again mm -hmm. <clears throat> if they decide not to do that we'll bring them back <laughs> but we want to we want to try and at least mm -hmm. when they leave have them better than when they come in and mm -hmm. that new jail will help us deliver the programs that I think is is going to help Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I feel that responsibility. You know, mm -hmm. we, we could just house people, but that doesn't make our community safer. No, no, no. You want your community to be healthy and right. people working and I don't involved. want more victims. Mm -hmm. I don't want more victims out there. Mm -hmm. So why wouldn't we uh, help the inmates when they're ready for it? Because not all of them, all of them are get to that point, but when they are ready, mm -hmm. here's what we have to offer. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it'll be a whole complete program from start to finish when they're getting getting prepared to be released right. and then get into the situation where they need to get all their ducks in a row before they go job hunting and whatnot. 
an example of that <clears throat> is right now in our main jail, we have a, a pod, it's a section of a floor in the jail. Mm -hmm. And we call it our TJC pod. It's their transition from jail to community. <clears throat> we have a, an instrument where we assess the inmate mm -hmm. to make sure that, that they're ready for the, the program and we address whatever their criminogenic need is. It might be substance abuse, it might be anger management, uh, it could be alcohol, it, it could be all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So we bring them in into our pod and they get personal attention from their probation officer. The probation officer they're going to have once they're released from jail, so they have that network and that relationship before they get out. And this took some convincing on my part to start this pot because I was old school. Oh, okay. <coughs> and they, told, they said, Sheriff, we're going to mix classifications, which mm -hmm. means they, they might be members of rival gangs. That's something we just have never done until we did this. Mm -hmm. So they, they're all in one pod. And we also don't choose the low hanging fruit. We don't choose the easy cases. These are inmates that are medium to high risk to re-offend. Mm -hmm. So that's where we make the biggest difference. The medium to high risk to re-offend. Okay. Now normally in the jail, the recidivism rate we know is 80%. 80% of the people booked into our jail has been booked before. In this TJC pod, it's 18% recidivism rate. And that's amazing. Yes. If we can replicate that in, in our new jail, uh -huh. uh, because it takes really a special place to be able to do this, we're going to make a big difference in public safety in Fresno County. Oh, my God. Yeah, that would be wonderful. And, and then you're going to have more <coughs> jobs there because you have to get bring people in that are going to, what types of, uh, they psychologists or mm -hmm. what type of? We, <coughs> we have... Um, social workers and psychologists that we work okay. with. Our correctional officers, are they volunteer to work in this pod. Our probation officers is two full-time probation officers that work in this pod. Mm -hmm. And so our new probation chief, Kirk Haynes, he's great. He's really, really good. Mm -hmm. And he's fully committed to this program because it takes all of us. It's not just the sheriff's office. Right. It takes all of us to make the difference. Okay, and where did you get this pod idea or was it brought from somewhere else? Yeah, we were we were approached by, uh, an, it's a national organization. It's the uh, National Institute of Corrections, NIC. Mm -hmm. And they said, we will help you with a planning grant for this idea of a transition pod. And they did, they sent consultants, they paid for it, it didn't cost us anything and it was just consulting and planning for getting something like this started. Mm -hmm. And that was almost three years ago now. And, uh, and I've told them when we started this, if this doesn't work, we'll go back to the old way. <laughs> but it's, it's got to work. I, I really have a, a pet peeve for programs that get started and then continue, but there really aren't good outcomes. Right. But nobody wants to pull the plug and say, we need to stop doing this. They just keep spending the money and, and keep it perpetuating. Right. I said, if this doesn't work, we're going to stop. <clears throat> but it's worked. They've proven to me that with that recidivism rate, uh, it's working. So you see, like, in the future jail, there would be a complete floor dedicated to this <coughs> system? That would be ideal. <coughs> yeah, I need my water. <clears throat> that would be ideal to have the, a complete floor. Because right now, we, the, the really maximum number of people that we should have is 25 to 30 people for it to work the best. Uh, but if we could get more, and it, but it's based on assessment, we can't have inmates saying, yes, I want to come and get help when they really don't need it. It, it really takes a careful assessment to make sure we get the right inmates that we're going to make the biggest difference. Mm -hmm. Sounds to me uh, <coughs> that the assessment you're look you're kind of going through and finding out again it comes down to commitment <coughs> are those particular inmates committed to when they leave and not return right. and stay with their families and get involved with the com 
community. Um, that's what it sounds, and that's what you do, right? right? Pretty much. <coughs> we, have, uh, we have really good testimonials from the inmates that have actually gotten out and gotten employment, gotten jobs, reunited with the family who have been involved with criminal activity, and they had, in prior times, just burned all their bridges. You know, their family tried to help for years. Mm -hmm. um, their friends had tried to help for years. And now the only friends they have are all others involved in criminal activity. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so it's really important for them to, we have one other program, it's called Thinking for a Change. And they have to understand that they have to think differently about being successful rather than immediate gratification, whether that's with substance abuse or mm -hmm. alcohol or, or whatever. They, it's really thinking for a change. And that's, in, that's a real important thing to, to hit on while they're in jail. And then they make the relationship with their probation officer. So they're not getting out and a few weeks later getting a cold call saying, I'm your probation officer, how you're doing. Right. You know, they, they have that relationship. They have somebody they can call right then. And then connecting them with the resources into the community they're moving back into. Okay, so it's almost hand, <coughs> hand holding kind of system, sure. step by step. You're getting ready to so leave us and we wanna be sure that you. They know they've got help. Okay. They know they've got their, a support system. Uh -huh. Now, uh, I realize that when someone's incarcerated for a period of time, they're losing familiarity with what's going on right. on the outside in the general community. So is there some type of bridge course or perhaps some debrief as to, you know, now it's like, for example, when we went from computers to having computers yeah. and then so do you do something for that part you, of that? You bet. We, we actually uh, are getting ready to start a tablet program in the jail okay. where inmates uh, can receive programs and help <coughs> on individual ta uh, tablets that they're, that they're going to be getting. Of course, we have to control it, the access that they have on mm -hmm. those tablets. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's through a company that provides the programming and uh, it, it's kind of the next step in programming with inmates. I mean, it, it, and we just started, it was just approved by the board today. Uh, oh, how exciting. We went to the board of supervisors today. Oh, <coughs> wonderful, that's exciting. That's so we're always trying to think of, ahead. Also in our, our new jail, we're going to have some video visiting so that people from their computers at home may be able to visit with the inmate. Okay. Some video court proceedings so that n the inmate won't have to go from the jail into court. They can, mm -hmm. they can do it right from the jail. Mm -hmm. So there's technology why there's a lot of things happening in mm -hmm. the law enforcement and corrections world. Um, what about the children? Because a lot <coughs> of inmates, whether female or male, yeah. they're separated from their children. Sometimes the child is perhaps an infant and they really have never had that relationship. Do we have some relationship building for them? We don't in the general jail population, but in the transition unit, we actually have contact visits with family. Mm -hmm. And so inmates might meet their children for the first time uh, when they're involved in this program. <coughs> Again, it's very um, assessment driven. Mm -hmm. And when w they get to the point where they're ready for that, it's, it's like the reward. You know, right. you do well, you really want to change before you get out. We're going to introduce you to your family, maybe little kids you've never been able to meet before, mm -hmm. and allow those visits to be contact visits. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, they're supervised, mm -hmm. but that's something new we're trying. Okay. And I know uh, when we first started on the, down this path, we <coughs> men you mentioned the high profile. Uh, high risk to high risk. Mm -hmm. Yes, for 32 years I've seen tattooing, but here in Fresno I notice they're having the tattoos all the way from the <coughs> head, all the way down. Uh, is there a program offered to yeah. remove those tattoos if they wish? The county has a tattoo removal machine, mm -hmm. uh, and we do have some people taking advantage of that. Mm -hmm. uh, I wish there were more, mm -hmm. you know, that would. There's certain conditions you have to meet 
mm -hmm. uh, before that's agreed to. And it takes a long time. You, you have to go back several visits to completely remove mm -hmm. a tattoo. And it's very difficult when somebody's made a decision to put a tattoo on their face to get it to completely go away. Mm -hmm. you're, there's always going to be something you're going to be able to tell something mm -hmm. was there. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so the lesson is, you know, don't go down that path. <laughs> don't, don't even start it because it's very difficult, right. especially on your face, to yeah. remove those yeah. the but tattoos. As you said, it's it's a hard. Uh, once they get into this particular lifestyle, they just go along. So right. I realize it's it's it would be nice for everyone not to do that, but it's a very popular thing to do now. And I was just curious. I know that. Uh, employers, do we have employers stepping up to the plate to volunteer to bring in some of the inmates? Yes. In fact, recently we had some media coverage on the transition mm -hmm. um, pod. Mm -hmm. And I had two employers call me. And one was a construction company. Uh, and the other is, uh, in, actually they were both construction companies. Uh, and then I had another call, and he he trains people on how to cut hair. Oh. And he says, I, I want to be involved and see if anybody wants a career in wanting to be a barber, for instance. That's wonderful. And so when people know about it, the community steps up. Okay. And all they have to do is call your office? <clears throat> all they have to do is call my office. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're giving us a lot of information. It's a lot. This is wonderful. Well, I hope that we can uh, bring more information to the public from I'd, your office. I'd be glad to come back. Yes, because uh, I think our citizens need to understand that, yes, we don't want everyone incarcerated. incarcerated. We don't want all of that. We'd rather everyone be OK and happy and right. prosperous. But sometimes and some crime free and crime free <laughs> but something sometimes things happen <coughs> and it's okay to ask for help absolutely right absolutely yes okay i know you're a busy gal and you have a busy schedule but i'd like to invite you back again maybe in the six months or something give sure. us a a debrief on how our our uh, uh, fresno county is doing uh, i've noticed quite a lot of cleanup i mean the homeless are, I'm, I'm hoping that we're getting some jobs for them. I know Cruz is working hard to bring in a lot of uh, resources. Mm -hmm. uh, I see that they're, uh, the crime, uh, Chief Dyer is working hard on that. You're, I know this county is huge and we have a lot of wide open spaces, so. We have a lot more good people than we do bad. And mm -hmm. that is uh, uplifting and that really helps our law enforcement keep going mm -hmm. because we do know that we're making a difference. Yes, I see it every day. So I want to thank you very much for coming in and joining us. And um, I hope to see you again soon or someone else in your department. I mean, you have a huge, huge organization uh, and you're adding more. And it sounds as though uh, Fresno is going to be seeing a lot more sheriffs and obviously a lot more help in the jail as well. Yeah. That's yeah. really great. We're making progress. Yes, I mean, moving forward. So in that, uh, the jail that they're building, how many people will it house? It will house 350. 350, okay. Yeah. All righty, but I like that pod. We need to learn more about that. Maybe we can get some people, you know, volunteers. I, I have people that will come and talk more about that. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think it would be good for the community to know mm -hmm. more about what we do because we do a lot and what we've touched on today is just a little of it. Yes, <laughs> that's what I'm catching, just the surface. So thank you very much. Thank you.